to start tonight's program, we're going to hear from Dr. Joan O'Keefe, who is the Director of Science. I guess I'll just hold it. So we better just make a small correction, Ms. Blunt, because my, uh, my technology education department will be very upset. I am the Director of Science and Technology Education. So. The teachers are here, so. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We haven't been together like this for three years. I can't even believe it. Believe it. It feels like yesterday. So um, look around you. You've just uh, seen all of the projects. This is amazing, beautifully organized, so well displayed, a true work of art. But our booklet, the posters and our students are not just for show. They, re they represent the creativity, interest, and hard work of 57 students from our science research program. For most of our seniors, it is the culmination of three years, which included learning from home, hybrid learning, and work over the summer. It's just remarkable what they have done despite the circumstances. And uh, science research is not a required course. Students take biology and physics and chemistry and all those good things. But this is an extra course that they take because they are interested. Um, they're curious. They're fascinated by the living and physical world. They're eager to make a contribution to the planet and help their fellow human being. More often than not, there is a personal connection to a disease, a community, and even an ideology. There are so many members of our community to thank. Dr. Wool and the Board of Education, all their support. Mr. Greenfield and Dr. Lisa Mulhill, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. Ms. Bukema, Mr. Mastroda, Ms. Griffo, our high school administration. Mentors from within our community and from outside organizations. Our internal review board, which consists of faculty administrators who've done their own research and helped to guide the students, especially with human participant projects. I would also like to thank Mr. Rowan, one of our science research teachers. He has tremendous knowledge and wisdom, which he used to guide two of our students through the research program this year, helping out Ms. Blunt. So thank you, Mr. Rowan. Where's Mr. Rowan? Come on up, Mr. Rowan. So nothing happens without the dedication and support of a fabulous teacher. I think five parents or sets of parents came up and talked to me about this. So this is why I want to draw attention to a teacher who has built this program into something that we can all be proud of. A teacher who raises the bar for every student involved. And for three students this year, it meant attending the International Science Competition in Atlanta, Georgia. Just an amazing thing. So I want to thank Ms. Blunt, because that's who I'm talking about, for inspiring each and every one of our science research students. Thank you. So, so this year we have 57 students. Next year we've got 69 registered. So that just goes to show you. I want to also thank uh, Mr. Randy Gunnell. He uh, is no longer one of our science research teachers, but he is here tonight. Um, he's passed the bar, he's passed the baton. And uh, even so, we had a call back to go to uh, the ICEF this year, and um, he had to plan everything uh, for his students here at home, and then spend the week with his kids, which he actually loved every second of it. So thank you, Mr. Gunnell. So also on display is the work of our students from our design and engineering program. And that's the work that you see along the side here. Wow, such innovation and excellent craftsmanship. I keep telling the tech teachers that we need to have our own exhibition, but they, they keep telling me that they like the foot traffic at the science symposium. One of these days, I'm gonna get you to have your own exhibition, okay? <laughs> um, when what you see tonight is the design work from another growing program. Ten years ago, this program had seven sections, and this year we had 12. 
So that is an increase of five sections. That's five times 25. That's 125 students more. So it basically doubled the program. So basically what's happened is we've shifted the student learning to more sophisticated and current computer-aided drawing programs, which is what you see on display there, uh, and developing projects with a focus on sustainability. And this type of learning is well designed to the IVMYP framework because of its focus on the design process, the local and world community, and the environment. Every time, did you see the lakes with the horseshoes? That's pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Those are recycled. Uh, we're going to go in the garbage and under Mr. Uh, D'Alessandro's uh, great teaching, uh, I, I'm sorry, the young lady is here, but uh, pretty amazing work here. Um, so every time I walk into the tech room, I'm in awe. I never want to leave it and the students love telling me about their work and I know that happens for everybody that enters that space. They're such an amazing group of kids. By the way, this is also an elective program for the students who take it. They do not have to take any of the courses in this program. And we have many students who take the program for four years. And you can see the result of the work that uh, they do. Um, I want to thank the teachers, Ms. Diane Frawley, Mr. Lou D'Alessandro. Mr. Lou D'Alessandro is right here. Great Mr. Michael Schweitzer. Mr. Schweitzer is back there, yes. None of it would happen without their dedication to growing the program and just new ideas every year because we have to move with technology. We can't stand still and that's what they do each and every day. So all I can say is I'm so glad we're back together again. Uh, I'm so proud of all the students. I always have so much to rave about. Every weekend, even Saturday, Ms. Blunt was sending me emails about, uh, texts about students who won at the uh, Somers Science Fair, the sophomores, so should be so proud of themselves. And they're gonna talk about the students right now, so I'm gonna stop talking. But thank you again for coming and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. The reason why I am I'm displaying this particular picture is because these were my first two students in science research, and one of them is here right now, Tasha, there she is. <laughs> and Emma was, was judging with you this weekend. And then we also have many other of our past research students here right now. If you've been part of Harrison Science Research and you graduated, can you please stand up? Because everybody should see everybody who's here. part of the program for years to come. So once a Husky, always a Husky, that's really true. And um, we're so proud that you all came to spend this time with us and thank you so much. And a few of you are class of 2020. So this is, right, 2021? What are, 2021. So you didn't have your own symposium, so it's very nice that you finally got to be part of this symposium. So the other thing, well, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, so this year, we've had so many great successes. So many. I can't even tell you all of them. I can't count all of them. Um, I'm so proud to have been part of this program. And as, as I said, we are a family together. We work together. We, we go to the fairs together. And we experience all of this success together. And it's something that's so special for me. It's really changed my life. So I really appreciate that I've been able to be a part of it with all of you. Congratulations to all of our students who competed and who were recognized at science fairs. And most of all, congratulations to everybody and all of their hard work, your dedication, and your great research. It has been such a pleasure to learn alongside you and from you. And I feel like I just continue to grow. Thank you for allowing us to join you on your incredible joint journeys, and we 
hope that you continue to remember us and come back like these students have for many years to come. Um, to our seniors, I, I always say this every year, it makes me very sad. You guys keep graduating and I keep staying. <laughs> Doesn't seem fair, right? Seems fair to me. <laughs> but you're incredible, all of you, and I'm excited that we're going to get to hear from you in a little while. You're great researchers, you're great students, and most of all, you're great people. You've set an incredible example for our younger students, and we're so I'm so proud to have gotten to know you and to be able to have been your teacher for three or two years. So thank you. Please come back and visit. Don't forget about us. Um, we want to share in all of your experiences, past and present and future. Just because we're you're graduating, please know we always continue to think about you. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to do is I want to introduce somebody very special. Um, we have one of our mentors here who's going to share a little bit about his research. He mentored my Blouski, who had a very Ooh. successful year. And <laughs> he's currently he had such a good experience with mine that he currently is taking on um, Rachel Kindler as well. So he's now mentoring Rachel as well. And I feel very lucky, personally, very honored that you agreed to come and share a little bit about yourself and about your research, currently from Manhattan College, and pretty soon making a big move. So please come tell us about it. Um, hello everyone, my name is Julian Silverman. I'm an assistant professor at Manhattan College. I'll tell you where I'm, I'll tell you where I'm going in a moment. Um, but I was a local, just like you. I grew up in Nyack, New York, just over the river, and I was part of the Authentic Science Research Program at my school that was abruptly canceled in my junior year. And if there's one lesson that I've learned, uh, not only working with my, but as my journey as a scientist, it's that science does not happen as you expect it. Um, can any of the researchers here raise their hand if something unexpected happened during their project at some point? Um, can you raise your hand if you expect that more unexpected things will keep occurring? Fair enough. Um, so I'll keep this pretty brief today. I wanted to share both my background, this sort of unexpected journey. Um, I also wanted to share a little bit about what it was like to uh, work with mine, which was a real wonder. And then I'll tell you a little bit about my current research to perhaps entice you to join me if you're interested in sustainability and green chemistry. So um, I will say that I was contacted by Mrs. Blunt through a colleague of mine and asked to take on someone with uh, their own project idea. And this is very rare in science. Typically students come to you and they want to know what you're interested in, what you're doing, and so it was really neat uh, to have my come to me with a project very focused in an application, but also very broad in terms of what we were going to do. Um, now, of course, this was last year during the pandemic, and so we did have the opportunity to work in person, which was a challenge, of course, on its own. But it was a real wonder, not only to again be working with a, a junior and budding scientist, um, but also someone who was really passionate and excited about things that they didn't know anything about at the very beginning, to be very honest in some ways. <laughs> with that said, um, I learned a lot as well. If there's anything I could say as a mentor, which is my primary function as a teacher, it's that I'm learning not only right how to bring up the next generation of scientists, but also really help inspire the work that I do and make sure that I'm not just this crazy person doing these crazy things. And so, uh, of course, I'm going to come back for this year with Rachel. We'll be looking at uh, the sustainability of different weird milks, I think is the uh, project idea. And so I invite you guys to not only see how that progresses, but right, also to sponsor and support all of the students that are around you here today. And so briefly, I'll talk a little bit about my research. I am what you call a green chemist. And so what I try to do is to take trash and turn it into treasure. Um, primarily, I work with things like natural dyes and mordants. Um, anybody here like avocados? Anybody here uh, throw out the shells or pits? So for example, part of the work that I do is to take this waste that we use, this food waste, and to turn it into natural dyes. Uh, the shirt I'm wearing was actually dyed not only with avocados, but also with waste iron. Part of my work is to send students out to New York City. They collect rusted iron, of which there is quite a lot in New York City. And they actually dissolve New York to sort of recreate this waste and transform it into new sustainable materials. Um, I can tell you that when I was the sophomore and junior research student, I didn't know about any of those things. So all of you are embarking on this journey and going to end up in places, as you already know, that you could never expect. And so I want to say thank you for letting me join you on that journey. And um, I'll let you know that it's a lot of fun if you haven't experienced it yet. 
And so I wish all of you, the ninth graders here today, the best of luck in your coming years. I wish the seniors and the juniors the best of luck where you're headed as well. And I invite you to join me and the other scientists around New York City and of course the globe as we discover amazing new things together. Thank you. developing a model in situ resource utilization system for oxygen sustaining life support and launch cost reduction for Mars. Now I am an aspiring future astronaut and my dream is to go to Mars one day. However, before this is a possibility, there are a multitude of issues that must be addressed. Mainly, the ability for human life to survive in such a hostile environment. Now it's not feasible to launch all required materials directly to Mars as the launch mass and therefore cost would be too great. And one potential solution to this is in tissue resource utilization, or ISRU. And this would use materials already existing on Mars for human benefit. Now, the Martian atmosphere is approximately 95% carbon dioxide, and this has the potential to be converted into oxygen for human benefit. Now, there are current systems that are being developed to do this process. However, many of these systems are through mechanical or chemical means. And I determined that plant growth may be a more effective means of completing this process, as it has the added benefit of being multifunctional as a potential food source, which reduces the total number of systems that would need to be launched. However, the issue with this is that similarly to how it's unfeasible to launch all life support systems to Mars, it would not be feasible to launch all required Earth soil directly to Mars, as the launch cost would be too great. And so it must be determined as to whether plants can successfully grow in Martian regolith or soil. Now, there has been no actual sample return of Martian regolith to Earth, but the most accurate simulant to date is the Mars Global Simulant, or MGS-1, as it's assembled from all of the individual molecular components. However, issues with this exist when studies have shown that when seeds are tried to be grown in the MGS-1, they have been found to be unable to even germinate. And this indicates that there would be issues with growing actually on Mars in actual Martian regolith. Now, other studies have shown that plants were able to successfully grow in ratios of earth soil and a Martian regular simulant, but these studies used MMS, a less accurate simulant than MGS-1, and didn't study oxygen production. And therefore, I was examining whether plants are able to successfully grow in ratios of MGS-1 and earth soil, and if so, what the ideal ratio for growth is, and what resources would be required to grow enough plants to support life. My hypothesis is that a threshold exists where tepary beans or phaseolus or cutifolius are able to successfully grow and produce oxygen in mixtures of MGS-1 and earth soil. And my goal is to determine the ideal substrate ratio as defined by a ratio with, that allows for maximum oxygen production with minimal launch mass and therefore launch costs. Now MGS-1 was used in my study as it is the most accurate single to date. And the potting mix I used was chosen as it contains perlite, which aids in water retention, and has high ammonium has a high ammonium nitrate content, which counteracts some of the issues with MGS-1. And tepary beans were used as they can grow well in a harsh environment with little water, which counteracts some of the issues of the Martian environment. And my independent variable was different ratios of earth soil and MGS-1 as measured by percent volume. So I created mixtures of 0, 25, 50, 75, and 100% MGS-1. Then, when growing the plants, I measured a variety of different growth parameters, including the biomass at the end of the study. And one important and challenging aspect of my study was having a controlled environment. And this was extremely important because ultimately, when I wanted to model oxygen production, having a controlled environment was necessary to ensure that these calculations were accurate. But due to impacts from COVID, I was unable to work in a controlled lab, so I ultimately had to create a controlled lab-like environment in my own basement and used grow lights on timers as well as thermometers, thermostats, and heat mats in order to create a simulated day and night. 
And here is an image of the setup so you can see in more detail all of the different aspects that I had to control in order to make the study valid. Now before planting could begin, I had to treat the substrates as MGS1 aggregates or clumps and watered, which prohibits healthy root growth. And this process involved crushing, watering, and air drying the substrates and repeating this process until it was qualitatively determined that no large aggregates would form. I then grew the plants in 560 cubic centimeters of the substrate and grew for a growth period of 20 days post-germination. Once this growth period was complete, I measured the wet biomass, dry biomass after dehydrating the plants, and above and below ground wet biomass. And ultimately, I found that no plants were able to even germinate in 75 or 100 MG percent MGS1, indicating that this threshold for growth exists between 50 and 75 percent MGS1. And this made me wonder why this is. And so when examining the below ground biomass, which is the dried root mass, I found that the plants in 50% MGS1 had significantly more biomass than in the control. And this suggests that it was forced to allocate more resources towards developing the root structures as the plants were unable to obtain the water and other resources that they required. Also, when looking at wet versus dry total biomass, the plants in the control had significantly more wet biomass than the, in the 50%. However, there was no such significant difference in the dry total biomass. And this also suggests that really one of the major issues with growing an MGS1 is the water uptake of the plants and therefore water retention properties of the MGS1. And this is really important because it means if MGS1 can be treated to retain water more similarly to earth soil, plants may be able to grow in larger quantities of it, reducing the required earth soil and therefore launch mass and cost. I then use these results to model oxygen production to determine what, how many plants would be required to support life as well as the amount of earth soil to determine the ideal substrate ratio. And a simplified version of this model involves extrapolating the plant height 75 days post-germination, which is estimated plant maturity, and using a linear relationship between biomass and height in order to determine the biomass at that time. I then determined that the dry bean has a biomass carbon fraction of 0.45, meaning 45% of the biomass is carbon, allowing for me to determine the carbon, car carbon content of each plant. This, along with the photosynthesis equation and assumption based on it, where carbon and O2 are produced in a one mole to one mole ratio, allowed for me to determine how much oxygen was produced per plant. And this, along with the idea that a reference crew member for emission consumes 0.92 kilograms of oxygen per day, allowed for me to determine how many plants would be required to be grown in each substrate in order to support human life per person per day. Now, these numbers, as well as the amount of earth soil used in each for a plant for each substrate, allow for me to determine how much earth-based mass would be needed to grow enough plants to support life. And I found that between zero and 25% MGS1, the number of plants required increased, indicating that each plant was less efficient at oxygen production. However, the total amount of required earth soil decreased, and this suggests that the benefits of reducing the amount of earth soil per plant outweigh the issues of needing more plants with decreased oxygen efficiency. And this means that the ideal substrate ratio is as much Martian regolith as possible, so long as germination rates are not inhibited, so as close to the 50 to 75% growth threshold as possible. Now, this is really important because current estimates for launch costs to Mars are around 45,000 US dollars per kilogram, meaning that by using even 25% MGS1, over 600,000 US dollars could be saved per astronaut. There were several limitations to the study, and many of them focused on the idea that this is the first time a study of this exact nature and a model of this exact nature has been done to the best of my knowledge. And so this means that oxygen and mass values are first order estimates, and the biomass carbon fraction used was based on a generic dry bean and Earth-like conditions, which could vary slightly in a Mars context. Also, the model was based on total biomass, which does not take into account the fact that plants in the 50% had significantly more below ground biomass, and so they likely produced less oxygen than demonstrated by the model. And while this means that the exact numbers produced by my model may not be 100% accurate, however, the trends are likely to hold true. In the future, research should be done to improve the accuracy of the model by measuring gas exchange more directly by growing in a more controlled environment, and by further defining the threshold between 50 and 75% by growing in smaller increments of the ratios. Also, one aspect of my study is that legumes were used, 
which have the properties of nitrogen fixation due to rhizobium bacteria and that's typically found in earth soil and symbiotic relationships between the root structures and this bacteria. And this forms root nodules that fix atmospheric nitrogen into ammonium, which plants use for growth. And now an issue with this is that the Martian regolith does not contain this bacteria, meaning that this nitrogen fixation cannot occur. In my study, it did not have a major impact because the plant growth was stopped before these root nodules had a chance to form. But in the future, if plants were grown to maturity, it must be determined as to whether Martian regolith can be inoculated with this bacteria in order to help with this nitrogen fixation. Also, the life support system design in general should be improved upon. One aspect of the MGS-1 is that it lacks any organic matter, which helps to both add nutrients and um, helps to stabilize the aggregates, which help with water retention. And so if more robust pioneer species could be grown in the MGS-1 first, plants may be able to grow in larger quantities of it, as it would help with water retention. Also, other aspects of the mission would likely be impacted by the number of plants used, such as water, energy, etc. And so the implications of this must be further examined. Ultimately, my hypothesis was supported, and I was able to successfully determine an ideal growth ratio between 50 and 75% MGS1. And this means that plants can likely be used as a successful life support system that would use ISRU to produce oxygen and reduce the mass and therefore cost of a mission. And this, I believe, is really important because in my opinion, human exploration of Mars is really one of the next frontiers of human exploration and human innovation. And so this research could help to make it a possibility in more near future. Thank you. So Ariella went to ISEP, as we said. Can we share a little bit? Okay, so she, not only did she go to ISEF, but she placed second in her category at ISEF. She came home with $2,000, plus she won an Air Force Award and came home with $750 more. So she was fairly successful and came home with quite a, a little, quite a, quite a earnings. Um, a, good, a good day, right? A good day. All right, congratulations, honey. Thank you so much. When she goes to Mars, you'll say you knew her when. <laughs> okay, so now this is my favorite part of the program, to be honest with you. What I'd like to do is, I'd like in a second, I'd like to call up all of our seniors because I want to introduce each one of our seniors to you and have them share a little bit about themselves, their research, and why science research was important to them. Um, so what we'll do is we'll create a line up here, and um, if you guys would come up, and we'll just pass the the microphone as um, and we'll pass the microphone down so first of all can you join me in giving them a big round of applause okay so first up I'm going to introduce Morgan he's going to be our first to speak and then you can just pass it down. You can introduce the next person in line, okay? So Morgan Remeza. Yeah. So hi, I'm Morgan Remeza, and I've been doing science research since my uh, sophomore year, so that makes three years now. Uh, I just love launching rockets. Um, I've launched rockets for the last 10 years. Uh, these rockets can be like four inches diameter, anywhere up to 16 feet tall. And I've been collecting onboard videos from these rockets during that time period. So my project this year, and I've done three science research projects, each of which won awards. Um, my project this year was to take the onboard video and use ArcGIS to analyze uh, trends in the geographic features of a wetland and evergreen forest. And what I found was that the trends were not only very consistent with climate models, but they increased at a very, at, that my um, aerial imagery was very accurate compared to satellite imagery from Google Earth. Uh, and that shows that high power rockets can indeed be used as an alternative method to collect, collecting aerial imagery for climate science. Um, other methods such as airplanes, helicopters, and drones that are currently used cost millions of dollars, so this is very important. And also this plays a big role in allowing uh, climate engagement with climate science with the average person because these other methods you, 
you can't really engage with uh, these like big commercial companies. So yeah, those those were the implications of my experiment, and uh, I just loved it. And um, my thoughts about science research is um, it's it's a lot of work, I have to say, but you know um, it's work that you love to do. So yeah, this so you should definitely get involved in science research. Um, you get to choose what you want to do, and it's really a good model for what you do in real life, more so than any other class. So I highly recommend it. I also want to give a shout out to um, the um, Technologies in the Modern World class, where I actually built a model rocket, 3D printed parts with our own facilities. And um, yeah, I, I actually made the tubes and the nose cone for it, and it was just an awesome process. So uh, all these STEM classes are amazing, and I, I highly encourage all of you to get involved. And uh, yeah, that's it for me. My name is Mai Blaustein, and so I looked at using infrared spectroscopy, which is a light-based detection device method, to identify date rape drugs in drinks, and I found that this was successful, and constructed a prototype that uses this technology to identify drugs in drinks. So this is my second year in science research, and it's honestly been one of the best experiences of high school. Uh, it just opens up so many possibilities and opportunities that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And I'm really grateful to my mentor and to Ms. Blunt uh, for helping me and just letting me take a passion and then actually research it and achieve results. So I'd really recommend taking this course. Uh, my name is Brad Nadak. Uh, it's my third year in science research. Uh, I looked at uh, utilizing cognitive psychology to motivate more socially responsible behavior uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I conducted an experiment uh, right here at the Westchester Mall, uh, and it was relatively successful. Um, in regards to science research, I think it's a great class. Um, personally, you know, I bounced around a couple projects, you know, had my own fair share of like setbacks and challenges, but. It is a fantastic class when you are when you're actually getting to do meaningful work in a way that you aren't able to do in many other classes, um, and it's a fantastic experience. You know, seeing uh, doing a project you're passionate about, seeing other people do projects they're passionate about, um, and it's a very unique class and an experience you don't really get in any of your other subjects. Um, I want to give a specific shout out to Ms. Blunt uh, because she is one of the reasons the program is so meaningful and, and so great. Uh, she was one of the most caring teachers, uh, really invested in the success of all of her students, and um, I don't think any of us would have had the success that we did without her. Uh, now I'll introduce Daniel Bell. Hello, everyone. First, I would like to thank all of you for coming. It really means a lot to me, and I know everyone else here. Uh, you allowed us to share our research, which we spent a lot of time on, uh, most of us spent three years, including myself. Over the past couple of years, I've been researching artificial intelligence and its overall adoption into healthcare. And this has really been meaningful to me because you know, really uh, all my life I've been interested in medicine and I plan on working in the field when I'm older. And we're uh, researching artificial intelligence, which is a concept not really taught in school. I never really learned about the subject until my dad uh, introduced me to it and ever since I've been really fascinated by it and science research has allowed me to really go all in um, on this topic that I'm so interested in and it's allowed everyone else here to do the same and I hope that any uh, freshmen here who are interested in doing science research look at all these presentations and how unique they are and how different they are to what you learn in school and realize that science research can be an opportunity for you to research really anything you want. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Jack Kelly. Um, I'm a senior in the program, I've been in the program for three years. Um, my research was about quantifying linguistic polarization um, in members of Congress, so applying different statistical analyses and computer-based algorithms 
um, to track members of the United States Congress. Um, and it had broad applications in terms of policy reform, but also in social science and understanding human behavior. Um, in terms of what I got out of this program, I think it really challenged me as a thinker, as a student, um, and pushed me in ways that I never thought was possible. Um, I often say this to Ms. Blunt that sometimes yeah. I never really thought like I'd be able to produce the kind of research that I was able to do. Many times running my algorithms, I'd come back and it'd be error, error, error. And you get really frustrated. Um, and that kind of challenge is really beneficial um, as a student. Um, and it really allows people to problem solve. Um, and I think it's a, a, a tremendous foundation um, for what people can do in the future. I'm very excited to be continuing research in college, going to study government, and very excited to further explore democracy reform as it relates to my project and at the college level. Um, so thank you so much, particularly to Ms. Blunt, who's just been so incredible these last couple of years. We're gonna miss you so, so much. But thank you for everything this program's given me. I am so tremendously grateful. Hi, my name is Katie Flieger, and this is my third year at the program. Um, my current research question as it stands involves the modification of the BNM 3170 molecule for the purpose of an HIV vaccine, which involves computational drug design and the modification of a pre-existing pre uh, inhibitor for the purpose of the creation of HIV vaccine, as I previously said. Um, although I only created this research question within the last two years, my story starts more my freshman year when I was forced against my will uh, to create a biochemical or bioengineering project um, about basically any new and upcoming bi biological technology. Um, in this project, I became uh, really interested in um, how uh, the first person was cured of HIV. Um, and so from there, I became super fascinated with the idea of working with HIV and seeing how I can make a positive impact within that field. And I really like the idea of just helping people and making a positive impact with doing, with doing science research. So I ended up coming to Ms. Blunt, and I came into her class, and she really helped me focus my topic and develop it into, into what it is today. Um, and what I really love about this program is the fact that I not only get to do the research that I want to do, it's the fact that I get to share it with others. Um, as you kind of saw in one of the slideshows, I was part of a summer science research program for uh, middle schoolers. Um, and Ms. Blunt invited me to join her, and I got to share my research with um, basically kids, and it was a really amazing experience. And I am just so grateful for everything that this program has brought me, but specifically um, really focusing my project and also allowing me to share it with others. So I want to give a big thank you to Ms. Blunt. She has been an incredible mentor this whole time. She's been so helpful in shaping my project, and I'm just so grateful. So thank you so much, and thank you all for being here. Hi, everyone. I'm Macarena Hesse, and I'm a third year um, in the science research program, and my project is currently determining target fundraising strategies uh, using donor data and setting behavioral shifts from multiple nonprofits. I actually also pivoted uh, away from my original idea my sophomore year due to lab closures from COVID and ended up being really um, impacted by, I was I volunteering at nonprofits and I saw the impact that COVID-19 had on them and I ended up reaching out to the YMCA and the American Pain Society and their local chapters and what was really meaningful about this process is being able to connect with managers there and understand the people behind this process, the people behind this data. I think one of the most um, meaningful parts of this entire experience has been the understanding the real world implications of all our research and actually seeing the people impacted by them. So that's something that I really have liked about this project and this project has like influenced what I want to study in the future and different research possibilities. As all of us have said, as Ms. said earlier, I feel like science research has truly been a family. I know that amongst many other seniors in the fall with STS, we all had many late nights, many questions, many struggles, and Ms. Blunt has been here through all of it. I didn't have a mentor, and she acted as both my mentor and teacher, and I really cannot thank her enough for all of us. a lot of human interaction in a lab and I couldn't because um, it was supposed to take place in 2020 but I wasn't able to go to a lab because of COVID. So that got me really frustrated because I wanted to do something like really big that had to do with all the biological effects of deception on the brain and how it could actually be 
transfer it onto someone's children, but I had to take a different turn. And thanks to my mentor, Dr. O'Keefe, and my teacher, Ms. Blunt, they helped me come up with many different solutions as to where I could um, conduct my study and how I could do it. So I ended up using what I had, which was high school students and the internet. So I set out to conduct a survey on students justifying where they would be more likely to lie, whether if it was in a in-person setting in a classroom or Zoom video setting or in text like Google Docs or email. And I needed them to identify where they were more likely to lie. And my hypothesis was proven because um, in my research, I found there was an upward trend um, relating to where they were likely to lie. So the more digital the setting got, the more likely they were to lie. So basically science research, research taught me to be patient, taught me to be flexible with my learning and what I want to do in life, and was well taught me to learn from my mistakes. Thank you. Hi, my, oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Gabby Maricini, and this is my third year of science research. And I looked at the relationship between a human's mood and a pet dog's emotional state. So originally, my sophomore year, I was going to conduct an in-person study. However, with COVID, I was unable to do that, um, and I had to pivot. But Miss Blunt almost helped me seamlessly, so it was very easy to pivot. Um, science research is honestly one of the best classes I've ever taken throughout my high, uh, high school experience because it's a class where you can pick what you want to research and. You have to. You can kind of go at your own pace. However, Miss Blunt helps you a lot with maintaining, staying on track, and keeping up with your work. Um, throughout my entire experience, Miss Blunt has honestly been like amazing. Like she's helped me with everything, and I honestly don't know how I'd do it without her. Um, but overall, science research has taught me a lot on how to research, and has taught me a lot of research skills, which I'm going to take with me to college, and has honestly just taught me a lot about what I want to do with my life and in the future. Um, which involves dogs, so I'm just really grateful that I took it and I recommend everyone to take it. Hi, my name is Yubiko Suzuki and this is my second year being in the science research. Um, I researched on uh, the, de the development and use of the new app could increase the social connectedness amongst other lessons during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I joined science research in my junior year, and I wasn't really interested in doing it. Um, unlike everyone else, I wasn't really passionate about it. But this pushed me through challenges. I really struggled in coding without any knowledge. But Ms. Blonde and my mentor helped me through this. Um, um, and I'm really grateful for them. Um, and for I say for the sophomore and juniors who are in science research right now, you might not be passionate about your topics or anything, but in the end you might change it. For me, it didn't change. I'm still pursuing my intended major in chemistry, but for some of you, may you might like end up being in this major in, in college. And it's like, uh, science research is like a great way, great opportunity to find yourself and what you wanna do it in the future, and yeah. Hi there, um, my name is Anna Fitzpatrick. I've been in science research for three years now. Um, I've loved every second of it. Um, my project is on the effects of tactile arts therapies in sensory memory retainment and visual spatial functioning. I know that's a lot of words, <laughs> um, but it's basically um, how can working with like clay or Play-Doh improve cognitive processes over a period of time? Um, I want to say first off thank you to Mr. Gunnell. Um, I had him in sophomore year and that was the year that COVID hit, um, so we didn't really get to work together for too long, but I really appreciate all that um, you did to help shape my research and Ms. Blunt too, of course. Um, she's been with me for my junior and my senior year and she's really pushed me to um, continue working it. And there were a lot of struggles and obstacles that came up. Um, she really taught me, you know, how to be resilient, how to be um, self-sufficient, how to really stay on top of myself. Um, that's one of the main things that science research has taught me is, you know, how to be self-disciplined, how to really advocate for yourself, and how to enjoy what you're doing and find who you are. So, yeah, I really enjoyed my time. <laughs> 
Hi, my name is Keelan Baswani, and I conducted a study on um, cognitive distortions, um, the, the patterns of cognitive distortions, which is a type of negative self-talk, on high school students and specifically adolescents. And um, my, my study took a little while, but um, I had a lot of fun with it. And with the help of Mr. Gunnell in my sophomore year and Ms. Blunt throughout my junior and senior year, it really pushed me for a lot of greatness in this process. And it even pushed me to explore a career in psychology and neuroscience in the future, which I also um, would like to pursue in research as well. And um, with this program, I definitely recommend it to other people. It, it not only helped me explore what I want to do in my future, but it also gave me the confidence to do that. And with that confidence, I am able to um, be, be more expressive as a person and explore um, my interests in mental health awareness and so forth. And I really thank um, Ms. Blunt and uh, all my teachers and mentors in the process for helping me. And um, it was just an amazing journey, so I definitely recommend it. Hi, I'm Maddie Heimwitz. This is my third year of science research. And this year, I studied how increased knowledge affects an inflammatory bowel disease patient's level of fear about their disease. And I conducted, I worked at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, and I conducted a study, and I asked patients with IBD ages 18 and older if more or less knowledge about their disease equates to more or less fear. And I did find that more knowledge about one's disease equates to less fear. So the more knowledge you have, the more comforted you feel. Um, I, for my experience in science research, as a previous IBD patient, it allowed me to take my passions further and bring them to life as I took a passion in psychology and my passion in being a past patient. And I was able to bring my research to life and kind of be like my own mentor and guided the research where I wanted to go. And I couldn't have done that without the three teachers. I was lucky enough to have each one of them. Ms. Blunt my sophomore year, Mr. Gnell my junior year, and Mr. Rohn this year. And each, each of them helped me develop my research into what it was today. And I had an amazing, amazing experience in science research, and I'm very thankful.